family structures could flourish. At the same time, they told me, uh, don't be misled uh, by all this talk about the importance of our cultural and family tradition. We are also, at the same time, very modern. We love our smartphones, they, they told me. Uh, we think capitalism is great. Our families are very business-oriented and successful in business. Um, we are working women, and therefore we are in favor of government-supported childcare programs. So this interesting mixture of what uh, might be called tradition and modernity in their attitudes about a women's rights and role in society points to the main question that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, how to achieve modernity successfully and are there different paths or is there only one path to modernity. If there are different paths, how different can they be and still be successful in economic terms, in political stability terms, in social stability terms? So in my country and in <coughs> debates in the uh, Western democracies, the, the mood about this question has changed a lot over the last 25 years or so. At the uh, collapse of communism, uh, the uh, public intellectual who you may be familiar with, Francis Fukuyama, uh, wrote that we were witnessing the end of history in the sense that the liberal model of modernity had decisively defeated its two major historical competitors, communism and fascist nationalism, and that the liberal model was the only one left. Well now, 25 years later, um, we're no longer so sure. We've witnessed the rise of China. We've witnessed the revival of Russia and the so-called uh, BRICS, some of which are sort of liberal democracies and some of which are not at all. Um, we've witnessed the hope for the liberalization of Arab societies in the Arab Spring, but we've also uh, witnessed the failure of that project in most places and a backlash against Western secularism and liberalism uh, in that part of the world. In the uh, Western liberal democracies themselves, we've been seeing the signs of crisis. Uh, we've seen the failure of economic regulation. We've experienced financial crisis, which has had consequences for the whole world. In Europe, there's been a slowdown of economic growth, as in Japan. Uh, these are societies that are uh, witnessing demographic collapse, where their rate of having babies is falling below replacement. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, these societies are failing to integrate immigrants successfully. Um, there have been failures of uh, a military response to terrorism, and international organizations of a liberal design, such as the European Union, have been struggling with their effectiveness and their political legitimacy. So uh, the question that uh, I want to ask is whether these setbacks and pushbacks against the liberal model of modernity and development 
suggest that there are alternative models of modernity that might do better or might do, at any rate, no worse than liberalism is doing, uh, or whether there's still something to the more traditional Frank Fukuyama end of history type view that despite these problems, liberalism remains the basic model uh, for any successful modernity. So uh, to start answering this question, I want to start with a definition. What is modernity? And uh, for this discussion, I want to offer you the following definition. Modernity is self-sustaining economic growth based on scientific and technical progress. So I'm picking this definition of modernity precisely because it makes no assumption about liberal institutions or liberal ideas. Um, I'm defining modernity in terms of science-based economic progress. And then I'm just asking the question, is there a relationship between liberal institutions and liberal ideas that's somehow necessary to produce this result? So at the most general level, I want to ask, what social institutions make modernity possible? The classic writings on the shift from tradition to modernity of the 19th century, Emile Durkheim, Max Weber, uh, these writings, which are still, I think, implicitly accepted by most Western social science would say that modernity was made possible by the shift from personalized social relations based on family, lineage, patron-client networks, and favoritism shown to members of one's own social or cultural group, a shift from that kind of personalized social relations to modern impersonal social relations based on rules that apply equally to all individuals in society. Uh, specifically, uh, those theorists of the institutions supporting modernity pointed to the importance of rational law and public administration based on rules that apply equally to most people in large social groups such as nations that organize economic activity and public administration. So the question is, how far does a society have to go in the direction of equality before the law and individual freedom of social and economic relations for this system to work effectively to produce self-sustaining economic growth? Um, in other words, how liberal do these institutions need to be to be economically effective? So looking around the world, uh, it's, I think, a fact that almost all the societies that have been highly successful over a long period of economic development have moved quite far in the direction of the liberal institutional model. They almost all have due process of law for almost everyone in the society. They have rule-based rights to property and the sanctity of contracts. Uh, they normally have non-discrimination based on birth characteristics of citizens, and uh, they 
normally offer very widespread rights to political participation through free speech, rights to political organizing, and fair elections of representatives um, that rule based on law. So yet at the same time, when we look at these liberal societies, we see that they retain deep internal contradictions that create some of the crises that I was mentioning at the outset of these remarks. Uh, one is the contradiction between liberty and equality, um, where equal legal rights lead to extreme inequality of wealth and therefore inequality of political influence. Another deep contradiction in the liberal model is the contradiction between the globalized economic division of labor, that markets are global, yet rights are often based on the nation state. Uh, there's inequality of rights, opportunities, and outcomes across different nations, despite the fact that the globe is developing economically as a single integrated uh, unit. And then another contradiction, which Frank Fukuyama talks about as the, one of the main themes of his new book, his thinking has developed a lot since 1989 when he said the end of history. He talks about the uh, continued presence, even in liberal democracies, of uh, patronage, favoritism, uh, the so-called revolving door between economic power in Wall Street and political power in the U.S. government. <clears throat> so, um, even though we see that most successful developed societies have liberal institutions, we also see that they retain these internal contradictions. So, Let's think about alternative models. Now, some societies have been quite successful in generating economic growth for a time, despite significant deviations from the liberal model of modernity. For example, uh, the communist developmental state under Stalin and the five-year plans. Authoritarian fascist states that, for a time, sustained rapid economic growth based on uh, dictatorial state-led management of the economy and a militarized um, form of stimulus of economic demand. And more generally, we've seen developmental states uh, with state-led capitalism. So how did they accomplish these successes? Um, mainly through what in the literature is sometimes called the advantages of backwardness. Latecomers to development can take advantage of uh, three things that help them catch up quickly. One is uh, that technology and forms of economic organization developed by earlier developers can be borrowed, mimicked, or exploited as sources of capital and markets for a rapid push towards development. The second advantage of backwardness is that late developers have inexpensive labor and underutilized natural resources that are just waiting to be mobilized. The third is that concentrated political and economic power in the hands of the state or centralized finance capital or centralized economic cartels can uh, use administrative means to 
mobilize these underutilized resources. Uh, and that this uh, administrative push matters more at the early stage of development than does the uh, efficiencies of demand in a well-regulated market. So if these developmental um, mobilizing states were so successful, why did their development models lead to a dead end? The first reason is the exhaustion of growth based on state-organized mobilization of underused factors of production. In the literature on Latin American development, this is discussed as the so-called exha exhaustion of uh, import substituting industrialization. In other literatures, this is called the middle income trap, something that uh, is happening right now in China in some analyses. In the, the socialist countries, the Soviet Union, uh, contradictions of building market socialism on top of uh, Soviet-style institutions of the planned economy uh, showed that the um, mobilization design worked in the early stages of development, but then led to inefficiency and uh, incoherence in economic organization later and the collapse of the Soviet model. A second problem with this kind of mobilization uh, state-led development model is the deadweight cost of corruption and 